our teenagers. Keep them, O oh God, from all of the temptations of the wicked world. And keep them from the lusts of their own nature. Work faith in their hearts and preserve that faith by the power of thy sovereign grace. Bless, we pray, the churches that we are a part of. We thank thee that we are bound together in the unity of the faith, the reformed faith, the faith of the sacred scriptures. Grant, Heavenly Father, that we may be preserved in the truth and in the way of the truth. We pray, continue to cause us to cherish the heritage that has been handed down to us by those who have gone before. Do not allow us to be overcome with apathy, with spiritual indifference. Stir us up, Heavenly Father, so that we may be renewed in our deep appreciation for what Thou, in the goodness of Thy grace, art pleased to grant unto us. Bless, we pray, our work together as believing parents in the instruction of our children in the Christian day schools. May they prosper under thy blessing. Remember for good our teachers who labor in the place of us parents. May they not become weary in well-doing, but persevere in the high calling that thou hast given to them in thy kingdom. Bless the work of the churches together the work in missions and extending the witness to the gospel of Christ throughout the world as well as in our own country. We thank thee for thy blessing upon the work of home missions in the establishment of a sister congregation that takes place this week. We rejoice, Heavenly Father, Thou art the one who sends forth the laborers. Thou art the one who gives the strength for the labor. And thou art the one who blesses the labor that is accomplished. We thank thee for this positive fruit upon our mission work. Bless, we pray, the work of the churches in the training of young men for the gospel ministry. Thou dost continue at this late date in the history of the world, to make it possible for us to maintain our own theological seminary. We thank Thee that Thou dost give us faithful pastors and teachers to occupy the pulpits of the congregations and faithful men to labor in the cause of missions. Bless our seminary so that for many, many years to come, until our Lord returns, if it may be according to thy will, that institution may be a blessing in the life of our denomination as well as in the life of the church, Catholic, the church in all the world. Now be with us as we turn our attention to thy holy word. Grant us the things that are necessary here, the minds that are necessary to understand, but especially grant unto us hearts that believe. May we take thy word with us out of the four walls of the church building at the end of the service tonight and tomorrow morning into the midst of this world in whatever place thou dost set us. Hear us for Jesus' sake. Amen. We worship the Lord by giving our offerings tonight for the Emeritus Ministers Fund and for special education.
Let's sing Psalter number 131. <clears throat> 131. The Lord is great with worthy praise. Proclaim his power. His name confess. Let's sing the four stanzas, all four, 131. the word of God together tonight in the fourth chapter of the book of Acts. Acts chapter four. Acts chapter four. We'll read the first 31 verses. And my text tonight is verse 13. The word of God at Acts 4 verse 1. And as they spake unto the people, the priests, and the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. The they there are the apostles, Peter and John in particular, preaching in the temple area. And they laid hands on them, and put them in hold unto the next day, for it was now eventide. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about five thousand. And it came to pass on the morrow that the rulers and elders and scribes, and Annas the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have ye done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner. 
Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. For the man was above forty years old, on whom this miracle of healing was showed. And being let go, they went on their own, to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which hast made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word, by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. There ends our reading of the word of God tonight. May the Lord add his blessing to our reading of the scriptures. I call your attention particularly to verse 13. Verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. In the context of our text tonight, people of God, the apostle Peter has miraculously healed the impotent man at the beautiful gate of the temple. That's all the way back to the beginning of Acts chapter 3. Seeing Peter and John coming into the temple, that impotent man who was begging at the beautiful gate into the temple asked alms of them. Children, alms is money given to the poor. Peter's response to the impotent man who could not walk, lying there by the beautiful gate, his response to him was, Silver and gold have I not, but such as I have I give unto thee. In the name of Jesus Christ 
of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Acts 3, verse 6. Immediately, the impotent man leaped up on his feet and walked. And he went with Peter and John into the temple, leaping and walking and praising the Lord God. In short order, a large crowd had gathered about the healed, impotent man and the apostles. And to that crowd, Peter preached the word of God, the gospel of grace. He preached Jesus Christ to them. He preached that the miracle by means of which the impotent man had been healed was a miracle not performed by himself in his own power or strength, but that that miracle had been performed by the power of the risen Jesus Christ. That preaching had angered the leaders of the Jews. They were upset, as you would expect, that the apostles were preaching and teaching in the name of Jesus Christ. They sent the temple police, and they immediately arrested Peter and John and cast them into prison. The next day, they were taken out of prison and were given an appearance before the Jewish council. The Sanhedrin, the ruling body of the church of that day. We might say before the consistory or the classis or the synod. And there they were tried. This is the very body, the apostate leaders of the church of that day that had condemned Jesus Christ and was responsible for the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Before that council, now Peter and John were appearing. To them, the question was put by the council. Verse 7 of our chapter, by what power, by what right that is, or by what name have ye done this? That was an altogether unnecessary question. The members of the council did not have to ask that question. They knew the answer to that question. They knew very well that the apostles had been preaching and teaching in the name of Jesus. That was the very reason on account of which they had arrested the apostles the day before. They asked this question of the apostles in order to intimidate the apostles. They asked this question in order to discourage the apostles. They asked this question in order to get the apostles to stop their preaching and to stop their teaching in the name of Jesus Christ. But the apostles were not at all intimidated. Peter spoke for them. His answer was a bold defense of their preaching and teaching. His answer was a bold setting forth of his faith in Jesus Christ. The council was amazed at the boldness of the answer. They marveled at Peter and at John. They marveled at them and took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. They identified them 
as the disciples of Jesus. And it's to that that I call your attention tonight. These men have been with Jesus. Let's notice, first of all, the bold confession of the apostles. Let's notice, secondly, the only explanation for it. That's the explanation. These men have been with Jesus. And let's notice the certain outcome. The apostles gave a bold confession before the leaders of the Jews, a bold confession of their faith in Jesus Christ. Before these leaders, about whom they knew that they were the enemies of the gospel, the apostles confessed Jesus Christ. Their bold confession before the Jews is contained in verses 9 through 12. I want to read that again. If we be examined this day of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name given under heaven among men, whereby we must be saved. They confessed Jesus Christ. They confessed Jesus Christ to be the Son of God. They confessed Jesus Christ to be the Savior. That's the sum and that's the substance of the confession that the apostles made. Their confession of Jesus Christ was a personal confession. That's always true about the confession of the faith of God's people. Not merely objective, not merely dogmatic, not merely certain truths or propositions, although to be sure, it is a confession of the truth and the confession of the faith of God's people is a confession of the truth of certain propositions, but always the confession of the faith of God's people is a personal confession of faith. Not only that Jesus is the Son of God, but that he is the Son of God for me. Not merely that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, but that Jesus Christ is my Lord and is my Savior. That certainly was true of the apostles, that their confession of Jesus Christ was this warm, this personal confession of faith. The whole of their confession breathes that personal character and that comes out at the very end of the confession in verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby not merely men must be saved, but whereby we must be, and implied, we are saved. This confession of the apostles was the confession of the Lord Jesus Christ that they made publicly. And that, too, is always the character of genuine confession 
of faith. It is always public. It must be public. And if it is not public confession of faith in Jesus Christ, in the end, it is not confession of Jesus Christ. For the Jesus Christ whom we confess demands that we confess his name publicly. This was true of the apostles. Clearly it was true of them. They had been publicly preaching and teaching in the name of Jesus Christ. It was exactly their public confession of the name of Jesus Christ that got them into this trouble. That was the occasion for their imprisonment and now their arraignment before the members of the Jewish Sanhedrin. Confession of faith in Jesus Christ is personal confession. It is the confession of the heart, but it is never confined merely to one's heart. It is never merely conviction of the heart, but it is always the open, the public confession of Christ. The apostles were not ashamed of Jesus Christ, but they confessed his name before all the world of their day. But the outstanding thing about the apostles' confession was that their confession was a bold confession of Christ. That's underscored in the text. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. That boldness is seen already in the fact that they openly and publicly confessed the name of Jesus. But that boldness is especially seen in the fact that they made their confession of Jesus Christ before his enemies. In the presence of those who despised Jesus Christ, who hated Jesus Christ, these were the enemies of Jesus Christ, these rulers of the Jewish Sanhedrin. They were known to be the enemies of Jesus Christ. These were the ones who had determined that Jesus Christ should be killed, that he should be crucified. And these are the men now who were responsible for sending the temple police to arrest the apostles. They were the ones who had imprisoned them overnight. And they are the ones who are going to threaten them in an attempt to silence their testimony concerning Jesus Christ. But before these enemies of the faith, knowing them to be enemies of the faith, the apostles made their confession of the name of Jesus Christ. They did not draw back. They were not silent. They did not compromise. But they confessed the name of Jesus Christ. They were not concerned for themselves, even though from a natural point of view, they might have been afraid of the consequences for their confession of Christ. They were not fearful 
of what might happen to them personally as far as their position in their families or in the church might be, the consequences that might be visited on them for making this confession. Oh, certainly they were aware of the possibilities here. What might happen to them for their making this confession that did not enter in to their making it without any fear for themselves, without any consideration for the consequences, they made their confession of Jesus Christ. Their confession was a bold confession. It belonged to the boldness of their confession of Christ before these enemies that they insisted upon it that this Jesus Christ whom they confessed was the only Lord and Savior. The boldness of their confession was their insistence upon it that there was salvation in none other name than in the name of Jesus Christ. That's the 12th verse, the verse immediately before our text tonight. The words of the apostles before the assembly, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. The implication of that statement, the clear implication before the members of the Jewish council was, believe on this Jesus Christ. And if you do not believe on this Jesus Christ, you are lost. There is absolutely no possibility of salvation. It was a call to repentance that came to these leaders of the Jewish council and to faith in Jesus Christ. What was true of the apostles? Their bold confession is true of believers in every age, is true of you, and is true of me tonight. It is certainly the case that there is a sense in which the apostles spoke the word of God uniquely in the text. They spoke of Christ in their office. They spoke the name of Christ in their capacity and in the authority of the apostolic office that they held. They were preaching there in the temple, and they were preaching before the Jewish Sanhedrin. The ordinary believer does not preach. So there is something unique about the confession and the statement of the apostles. Nevertheless, there is certainly a sense, a very important sense, in which every believer is called to confess the name of Jesus Christ. There is an important sense in which every child of God, in whatever circumstances of life in which God has set you, no matter what your calling may be, it is your calling to speak the name of Jesus Christ and to speak the name of Jesus Christ with boldness, the same kind of boldness that characterized the apostles. Verse 31 
makes that plain. The last verse of our scripture reading tonight, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled. Now the apostles have gone forth from the Sanhedrin, and in, they are in the company of fellow believers in the congregation at Jerusalem, where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they, they all spake the word of God with boldness. To be sure, the believer never speaks the word of God apart from the preaching of the gospel, divorced from the preaching of the gospel, in isolation from the preaching of the gospel. That never. It is exactly the preaching of the gospel that equips him to confess the name of Jesus Christ and to confess it boldly. Nevertheless, this is the fruit of the preaching of the gospel in the lives of God's people. And this is the calling that every believer has from God and from Christ that we confess Jesus Christ publicly and boldly. Every believer has the calling to confess Jesus Christ to be the divine Son of God, Lord of lords, King of kings. Every believer has the calling to confess Him to be Savior, Savior alone, the only Savior of men. Every believer has the calling to confess Jesus Christ personally, to confess Jesus Christ as the Jesus Christ upon whom you believe, in whom you trust for the forgiveness of your sins and for your righteousness before God now and in the coming day of the judgment. Confession of the name of Jesus Christ must be personal. Every believer has the calling to confess Jesus Christ publicly in all the world, whether on the job, at work, in the office, on the assembly line, at the construction site, to confess the name of Jesus Christ at school, whether that's our own day schools, or whether that's university or college, to confess Jesus Christ in our everyday dealings with neighbors and friends and family, to confess Jesus Christ publicly, openly, and every believer has the calling to confess Jesus Christ with boldness. In the end, there is no confession of the name of Jesus Christ except that confession is a bold confession. The bold confession that insists upon it that there is no salvation apart from Jesus Christ. The bold confession that calls men to repent of their sins and to believe in this Jesus Christ, taking refuge for salvation for time and for eternity in the name and under the blood of this Jesus Christ. This is confession of the name of Jesus. For that confession 
And for the boldness with which the child of God makes that confession, there is an explanation. There is only one explanation. It was especially this boldness of Peter and John that amazed the members of the Jewish Sanhedrin. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they marveled that Peter and John were unlearned and ignorant men. It doesn't mean they were dummies. They were not. But literally, they were unlettered and common men. They had no formal education like the members of the Sanhedrin had formal education. They were doctors of the law. They were the professional scholars of the day. They were teachers and professors. Peter and John did not have that kind of formal theological training. Neither did they belong to the upper levels of Jewish society. Accustomed, therefore, to stand before others in these kinds of crowds, and to make these kinds of speeches and presentations. They were ordinary fishermen, commoners, ignorant and uneducated. And yet, what boldness, what confidence, What calmness about their demeanor as they confessed their faith in the name of Jesus Christ before all the members of the council. What could be the explanation. What could be the reason for the impression that Peter and John had made upon the council? That's what the leaders of the Jews asked. What could possibly be the explanation? There could only be one explanation. Without hesitation, they themselves gave the explanation. What was the explanation? That these enemies of Jesus Christ themselves gave? These men have been with Jesus. It's obvious. It's evident. It's evident to all that the explanation for the boldness and for the confession that these men make is that they have been with Jesus. They had been with Jesus. That means more merely than that they were acquaintances with Jesus. They were familiar with Jesus. It means more certainly than that Jesus only had made an impression upon them. That can happen. There are Christian school teachers who make an impression upon their students. Friends may make an impression upon friends. Even a co-worker may make an impression upon us for one or another reason. There's something more, much more in our text behind what the enemies of the gospel say here. These men have been 
with Jesus. That the disciples had been with Jesus means, first of all, that they had sat under Jesus' instruction. They had been taught by Jesus. They had been taught by Jesus over an extended period of time. What Jesus himself taught, they clearly believed. The instruction that Jesus had given to them was obviously instruction that they had received and that now they were also themselves teaching others. And secondly, that they had been with Jesus, that they had heard Jesus' teaching and received his instruction besides their being with Jesus indicates that they followed after Jesus as his disciples. They were not merely in some casual way associated with Jesus, but they identified themselves with Jesus, one with Jesus. Jesus was their master. Jesus was their Lord. They were Jesus' committed disciples. They had been with Jesus. This is true. This must be true of everyone who confesses Jesus Christ. Men say this about you. Do they not? Young people, men say this about you, do they not? People of God, this is what the members of the community here say about you, is it not? If they do not come Write out and say it in so many words as the Jewish Sanhedrin said it in so many words. Nevertheless, this is what they say within themselves, isn't it? This is what they say to each other. The members of the council did not say this to the disciples' faces. They said it among themselves in a way the disciples had no way of knowing that this is what they said about them. But they knew. Oh, they knew. This is so, isn't it? Of those who know you, how you live your life, What you say, what you don't say, what words don't pass over your lips on the work site, on the job, or in casual acquaintance. This is what they say about you, isn't it? Because of what they observe of your life, your family life, your marriage, what you say about your wife, what you wives say about your husbands, what you children and young people say about your parents, What they observe as far as your priorities in life, what are the most important things, the things of greatest value to you, what they say about you tomorrow morning, when it comes out, 
that your Sunday was spent not working, not playing, but worshiping God publicly twice in the Lord's house. This is what they say about you, don't they? Because the kind of employee that you are, how you devote yourself to your earthly occupation and the kind of respect that you have for the boss and the owner. This is what your employees say about you, is it not? Because of the kind of employer that you are. These men, these women, these young people, these children, they have been with Jesus. We see that in them. You can hear that in how they speak. This is what we note as far as their lives are concerned. They have been with Jesus. The enemies say this. The enemies are never going to say this if those who are close to us do not say this and do not see this in our lives. If our wife doesn't say this about us, if our husband doesn't say this about us, if our parents don't say this about us, if our classmates don't say this about us, if our teachers at school don't say this about us, how in the world is it going to happen that those outside of the church, the enemies of the gospel, are ever going to marvel in us and with amazement say about us, these people, have been with Jesus. They know Jesus Christ. They honor Jesus Christ. The enemies must say this about us. Certainly. But it begins at home. In our families. In our marriages. In our life. In the congregation. You've been with Jesus. That's being with him where he is found, of course. That's here in church. To be with Jesus means that you're with him in the church that is his body. Here he reveals himself. To be with Jesus is to be close to him in his word, in the scriptures. In the preaching and teaching of those scriptures, you can never be with Jesus apart from being with Him in the fellowship of His church and being with Him in His Word as He proclaims the glorious gospel of His saving work. You children, you are with Jesus in your catechism work. Catechism is about done for another season. Catechism is very important. A very important work of the church in your instruction in the truth of Jesus Christ so that men will say about you, these children, these young people have been with Jesus. That makes catechism very serious, doesn't it? Going to catechism and being prepared for catechism. You are with Jesus in the catechism room. We are with Jesus in the study of his word, ourselves, our own reading and study of his word, and in prayer. Both of those come out here. The apostles, after all, are preaching and teaching the Word of God 
In the verses immediately before our text, the disciples quote Psalm 18 as fulfilled in Jesus. The one whom you rejected is now the headstone of the corner. We are with the Lord Jesus in the scriptures. And they were men of prayer. That comes out in that last verse that we read together. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and spake the word of God with boldness. They spoke the word of God with boldness through the prayers and as God's answer to the prayers that they made to him. People who are with Jesus are with him daily in prayer. They had been with Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. We must honor the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit tonight. And that explains the boldness of the apostles. There's no natural explanation for that. It's not a matter of their personal character or their makeup. But the explanation for their boldness is the Holy Spirit. Verse 8, then Peter filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them. His bold confession was the confession that he made by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the explanation. It isn't merely that we are with Jesus. Judas Iscariot had also been with Jesus, just as Peter and John had been with Jesus. And the same is true of many today. They're brought up in the church. They go to catechism. They may even make public confession of their faith. But they have not believed on Jesus. They are not following Jesus. They do not boldly confess the name of Jesus. The explanation is due to the work of the Holy Spirit. This is the great work of the Holy Spirit. And this is the outstanding evidence of the Holy Spirit. Just this, that we boldly confess the name of Jesus. The work of the Holy Spirit explains conviction of the truth of the Word of God. The work of the Holy Spirit explains a willingness publicly to confess the name of Jesus even when this confession may mean suffering and affliction and may mean that we rouse the opposition of the enemies of the gospel. The work of the Holy Spirit, this explains the determination to walk in such a way that the world says about us, these people have been with Jesus. The certain outcome, the certain outcome was that the apostles were threatened and warned not to speak any longer in the name of Jesus. The world, and that includes and is especially in the text, the world of the false and apostate church hates Jesus Christ and is offended at the name of Jesus Christ. As they hate Jesus Christ, so do they hate those who are the disciples of Christ and those who confess the name of Jesus Christ. Be certain of that. Certain of the rejection and certain of the persecution that your confession of the name of Jesus Christ will bring. And it's worsening. The days are becoming darker. The certain outcome of our confession 
our bold confession of Jesus Christ, the Jesus Christ who is the only Savior, the Jesus Christ who reveals himself as the Son of God in the Scriptures, is going to mean persecution. It is. The threats and persecution do not shut the mouths of the disciples of Jesus. And that, too, is the certain outcome of our being with Jesus. The disciples would not be silenced. They would not be intimidated. They did not draw back in fear or terror for themselves or for the consequences. They went forth from the Jewish council. They reported everything and then they prayed to God for the boldness to continue to confess the name of Jesus. And that prayer God heard as the very last part of verse 31 informs us. And they spake. They kept on speaking, notwithstanding the threats of the council. They spake the word of God with boldness. That too it will be and is the certain outcome for us, for our children, who confess the name of Jesus Christ. The outcome is that by His grace, He will preserve us in the confession and in the boldness of the confession that He is the Christ. The certain outcome for those then who confess and persevere in the confession of the name of Jesus is that he confesses them. The outcome is not merely that it is observed and said about us that we have been with Jesus, but the outcome is that he is with us. With us now. With us eternally with us in such a way that notwithstanding the persecution of the world, he is with us to the end. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, work in us the bold confession of faith in Jesus Christ and grant that about us it may be said, that these men have been with Jesus. Be with us in the week ahead by the word that we've heard today and by our worship before thy presence strengthen us for our life in the midst of this wicked world. According to thy will, gather us next Lord's Day. In Jesus' name, amen. Sing together number 385, 385. O Lord, I have confessed thee to be God alone. O hear my supplication and be thy mercy shown. All of the stanzas, all three, 385.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with you forever. Amen.